The Tragedy of Hamlet, Prince of Denmark, is one of Shakespeare's most iconic plays. Written between 1599 and 1601, it is notorious as being Shakespeare's longest play, but is also so well loved and remembered for the simple reason that we still have so many questions about this prince, his mind and his motives. The play focuses on Hamlet, Prince of Denmark, after the King of Denmark, Hamlet Senior, has recently passed away. Now, Hamlet's uncle Claudius has married his mother Gertrude, and the two are now ruling over Denmark. And Hamlet is struggling to cope with the grief of having lost his father, whilst also having to work with the baffling fact that his mother seems to have inventively married his uncle, a difficult prospect for any of us to understand, let alone live with. The play opens in a unique way. No prologue or starting monologue, which is classic for Shakespeare, but with a simple question. Who's there? It transpires that the ghost of Hamlet Senior has been spotted, and young Hamlet confronts this supernatural being. He is then told that Hamlet Senior was murdered by his uncle, the man who now sits on the throne of Denmark. This changes everything. Hamlet needs to know more about whether this is true, and if so, he wants his uncle held accountable for his actions. Hamlet decides to feign insanity, pretending to be driven mad to weed out the truth and forward revenge. However, the big question continues to remain. Is Hamlet's madness truly feigned? Or is there a tipping point in the play where his madness becomes reality? But enough about the men, as this monologue focuses on the characters sidelined by society, the women. There are two key female characters in Hamlet, Gertrude, Hamlet's mother, who delivers this monologue, and Ophelia. Ophelia is Hamlet's love interest, and at the start of the play, the two are courting. Ophelia's father, Polonius, is a trusted friend of the king, and is asked to spy on Hamlet. Polonius even intercepts the letters that uh, Hamlet sends to Ophelia, and when it appears that the young prince has descended into madness. Hamlet mistakenly murders Polonius, thinking he's his uncle, and the loss of her father causes Ophelia's mental state to drastically deteriorate. This monologue is so important, because it is the moment where Gertrude delivers the news of Ophelia's death to her brother Laertes and the King Claudius. The monologue is beautifully written. Iambic pentameter shows Shakespeare's desire for the poetic nature of language to flow and links to a heartbeat to ring true in Gertrude's emotions. She starts by telling us of a beautiful scene, the willow growing aslant a brook, the water glassy. Ophelia arrives laden with flowers, nettles, daisies, long purples. This paints a compelling picture. The young Ophelia, who is last seen giving flowers and plants out to the court in honour of her murdered father, is once again presented as an embodiment of nature's ability to grow and replenish. Nature continues to grow through the hardest of times, and Ophelia's close links to nature are no coincidence. As she desperately tries to cling on to the last fragments of sanity in her grief, she is constantly trying to grow, to heal, to mend. But it's no use. Gertrude then describes how Ophelia was attempting to hang flowers upon the tree, when a branch broke and sent her plummeting into the brook. She then uses a simile, mermaid-like, to describe how her clothes keep her afloat as she sings to herself. But soon she was overcome by the weight of her sodden garments and is pulled under to drown. The grief is too much, and she is unable to grow out of the pit of despair she finds herself in, and both physically and metaphorically is drowned. The language of the monologue hugely focuses on beauty. Describing the scene in such detail, it could even link to the beauty of nature found in the later Romantic poets. And there's no doubt that works like these went on to inspire Shelley, Wordsworth, Blake, and more in their pursuit of nature's power over man. This monologue is additionally fascinating, because it poses more questions than it answers. Why does Gertrude not break this news bluntly? It's arguably more painful for Ophelia's brother to have this scene of serenity and beauty described to him before being told this news. Why not just say it? Then again, he is already dealing with the loss of his father. Perhaps Gertrude is trying to soften the blow and remind Laertes of his sister's beauty in life. There's also a variety of theories that argue Ophelia may have committed suicide, and this is Gertrude's way of keeping her close to God. As a heavily religious society, suicide was seen as highly sinful, and this may show Gertrude's true care and compassion for, for Ophelia in wanting to save her from damnation. We can also ask, did Gertrude see this happen, or is this a second-hand account? 
She describes it in such detail, it's easy to think that she may have seen this firsthand. She even knew what kinds of flower Ophelia was holding, which would surely have been washed away in the river. So it can only be a detail that a first-hand account would know. Then again, if we think about it logically, why would the Queen of Denmark be outside with a noblewoman who has recently become dangerously unstable? They may have been with some others out for a walk, but again, if this was the case, wouldn't someone have tried to save her? Whilst her clothes were momentarily holding her afloat, there could have been time to pull her out of the brook, unless she was purposefully left. Arguably, the most compelling question to ask is, why is it Gertrude who gives this news? She's Queen of Denmark, a woman recently widowed and remarried, a woman with a large number of social responsibilities, a woman whose son has been sent away from his homeland due to his insanity and murderous tendencies. She's emotionally exhausted, and yet Shakespeare chooses her to share more grief with the characters and the audience. Why? I personally believe there's some subtle feminism at play here. These two female characters are continually overlooked by men in this play, to the point where their emotions and minds are deemed insignificant. I think Shakespeare makes this choice to show that only a woman could truly see the damage done to Ophelia by the men around her. And only a woman had the right to bring this news of the true damage of the patriarchy. Shakespeare was continually subtle in delivering controversial ideas about women in his plays. Just look at Lady Macbeth. But this is all hearsay. Without speaking to the bard, we'll never know. So I encourage you, as you watch this monologue, to think. Why Gertrude? Why the beautiful scene? And who really saw this happen to Ophelia? There is a willow grows aslant a brook that shows his hoar leaves in the glassy stream. There with fantastic garlands did she come of crow flowers, nettles, daisies, and long purples that liberal shepherds give a grosser name. But our cold maids do dead man's fingers call them. There on pendant boughs her cornet weeds clamoring to hang an envious sliver broke when down her weedy trophies and herself fell in the weeping brook. Her clothes spread wide and mermaid-like a while they bore her up, which time she chanted snatches of old tunes as one incapable of her own distress. Or like a creature native and endued unto that element, But long it could not be, till that her garments, heavy with their drink, pulled the poor wretch from her melodious lay to muddy death.